Hello, I am Edip Yüksel. Merhaba, ben Edip, but I will continue in English. Uh, today I will be interviewing uh, Leslie Hazelton on her book, The First Muslim. Let me show you the cover. Perhaps the covers are differ different. You know, it's same. Paper back same. This is a beautiful same. color. Different cover. The, the British UK edition is the different. Okay, color. UK edition is different. Yeah. Okay, it's a beautiful book. Please uh, give me that one too. And uh, well, uh, I have been uh, in touch with her communicating through phone for several years, three or four years. And at uh, that time she was in the process of writing and uh, <laughs> I was waiting for the book but I was late to find out that well it is already out and this is uh, the British cover which is not as good as American one. Um, she is an impressive lady. I love this book. I r highly recommend anyone who is interested in reading a biography about one of the most influential man in history. Um, what was his name? Michael Grant? Uh, <laughs> a, a Chicago historian. Most likely I remember his name not very correctly. Uh, his book, 100 Greatest, he has his own set of criteria according to that. He evaluated many influential people, military leaders, politicians, uh, scientists, uh, messengers, prophets, religious people, and then according to that list he put Prophet Muhammad on top. Uh, by that I don't mean, uh, when I say that, I don't mean Prophet Muhammad was the best of all humans. I don't put prophets, messengers, or philosophers in rank. Uh, I think it is a pretty arrogant way of doing that, which God did not do that. But uh, therefore it is very important, whether you like Prophet Muhammad or not, his, his influence still continues. Uh, and this is uh, by far the best book I read about. Uh, why? Because uh, it goes to resources, Ibn Ishaq, uh, classic resources, Ibn Ishaq and Tabari. One is uh, during Umayyad time, then the other is during Abbasid dynasties. And, uh, but she is also critical. That's the beautiful part of this book. And critical and also generous. The language is fantastic. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's see. Okay, okay Leslie. Um, yeah, welcome to my study. <laughs> I like your this uh, little room. Uh, if we both of us sat together, would be better. But this is the only cozy environment we could blacken the background, <laughs> and it's very light, beautiful environment. Where do you sit? On I'm sitting on, on literally on Lake Union in Seattle. I we are floating right now. We are floating on 40 feet of water in a houseboat. Which yes. is why there's no room for two people in my study. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have a wider room, but it is very light. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, do you want to tell me anything about Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari? Because you really study these sources. Oh, I love those guys. Yes. And uh, uh, let me see what you said about them. Just quote, and then you continue. You said, the constant guides through his life are two early Islamic histories, the lengthy biography of him written in 8th century Damascus by Ibn Ishaq, on which every subsequent biography at least claims to be based, and the more politically focused history of early Islam by Al-Tabari written in late 9th century Baghdad. Mm. One more statement, if they erred, it was deliberately on the side of thoroughness rather than judgment. Just briefly in minute. I love, I, uh, I guess everybody claims to have read them. They're in yeah. all the bibliographies and so on, but it was only when I went back and actually read them that I realized that, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe they haven't been read. <laughs> because what I found there was, you know, I'd read so many biographies mm -hmm. of Muhammad. And the honest truth is that most of them were what my mother would have called a snooze, my Irish mother. They would, you, you, you could fall asleep quite happily, you know, quite easily with one of those on your chest. Um, 
they took this, what was clearly this most amazing life, this incredibly dramatic story. I mean, just the arc of his personal story is tremendous. And they made it into either out of, uh, either because they were writing devotional, you know, mm -hmm. kind of hagiography, or because they were sort of very, very timid and didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings and therefore tiptoed around the more mm -hmm. controversial aspects of his life. Um, they managed to make this incredibly interesting and dramatic life, as you say, one of the most important lives ever lived, mm -hmm. boring. So I was just looking for it. I could see the, all the juice was missing. And then I went to Nishak and Al Dabari. Yes. And there was the juice. There was the vitality. Because what these guys did exactly. is basically they wrote oral history. They interviewed people all over the empire at the time, the Muslim empire at the time. And they got these wonderful stories. Now, true, these stories were you know, third and fourth hand because time had passed. But they were very, very careful to attribute. They said, OK, I heard this from A, who heard this from B, who heard this from C, who was there when it happened. Yes. One version. But then there could be up to 20 versions. So you get, I heard this from G, who heard this from H, who heard this from I, who was there when it happened. Right, and, so. yes. and you get all these different versions. And they all, the, the personalities show through so clearly. There's one guy, for instance, who'll talk entirely in dialogue. He just gives dialogue. There's another one who'll just tell the most wonderful story with incredible details, sort of details that just stand out. There's another who'll tell the sort of, you know, uh, the devotional, regular story. And you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you put them all together, and you get this, the, the, this tremendous vitality. It's like you're back in the seventh century in these people's memories. And it was just so exciting because that's where I found the meat of the story, the detail. Muhammad came alive. Here I was in 21st century Seattle, and it's like I was living in 7th century Arabia. It's like I was living two lives at the same time. It was a privilege. Okay, uh, perhaps uh, you better look at here. I would be standing here better. Okay. That's okay. It is informal. You Feel free. Yeah. I'm not one of those very formal guys. Here is on. Um, Page 10, 11. Oh, first, who are you? <laughs> if someone... <laughs> someone do, do not know about you, let them hear about you. Uh, let me show this one here. A little, the back of the book, in case someone reads. Okay? No one does an interview. Cover the face of the interview. No, they're, okay. they're, they're not going to read that. Okay. Uh, now, tell me about what, yourself. What does it say on the back of the book? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see who am I. Uh, Leslie Hazelton reported on the Middle East from Jerusalem for more than a dozen years. That's true. And has written for Time, the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, and Harper's, among other publications. Also true. Her last book, After the Prophet, was a finalist for the Penn Center USA Literary Award. True. Hazelton lives in Seattle. <laughs> here right now. Um, that's part of who I am. You know, when you write a, a, you yes. know, a, a, a thumbnail biography, that's, that's what you get. I am, uh, and this is part of, I know, has been the interest in, in this book for uh, many Muslims. Uh, I am an agnostic Jew. When I say agnostic, I mean I, um, well, I'm writing a book about that at the moment. <laughs> but uh, I'm not observant. I'm not a believer. But I am fascinated by the interweaving, the intricate interweaving of politics and religion. And of course, nowhere has that been more so, and is still more so, than in the Middle East. Uh, I covered politics for a long time from the Middle East. And um, I'm just, it, it, it's just this, this huge, immensely volatile area of human thought, endeavor, passion, that um, I really think needs to be dealt into far more. Uh, and I came to this book to write about Muhammad because, well, I've written a biography of Mary, as in virgin, and then one of Jezebel, as in not exactly virgin. Uh, and, um, and then somebody suggested I write a biography of Muhammad, and I, I laughed. I heard, who, me? What chutzpah? I mean, I know I'm Jewish, but you know, there's, there's a limit to chutzpah. Uh, but I started reading about him in any case, and... Then the question came up, and it was just after a, a horrendous, concerted series of attacks in Karbala, in Iraq, uh, of bombings. And um, 
the question came up, well, how could Muhammad, the prophet of unity, yes. leave behind him, apparently, practically on his deathbed, this seemingly unending legacy of division between Shia and Sunni? Yes. And that was, to me, a, a fascinating question, because all I could find, you know, at first were just thumbnails, you know, sort of like yeah. that thumbnail of me, uh, which were terribly unsatisfying. And, uh, and that's when I discovered Al-Tabari and started reading him and again it all just came alive. So I knew I had to tell the story. I had to answer this question that so many people in the West were asking, well, you know, it was 1400 years ago, why? Just no understanding of how deep a story can go, how deeply it resonates in the hearts and minds of people over the centuries and still today. And of course, the moment I finished that, and that's a book that basically begins on Muhammad's deathbed. Mm -hmm. Then what I, is the title I, of the book? After the Prophet. After the Prophet. Yes, the, yeah. uh, after the Prophet, the, um, the epic story of the Shia Sunni split is the, is the subtitle. And the moment I finished that, I just practically automatically knew... Exactly, next that book. <laughs> now I had to write the life of the Prophet himself. Okay, the first Muslim, the title is provocative for me because... Uh -huh. uh, I, you know, I translated the Quran in two languages, English, yeah. uh, Quran the Reformist translation. Mm -hmm. I sent to you perhaps, since to. it was not popular and vastly distorted, you didn't look at it. <laughs> I have it here. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm kidding. And that translation, uh, I, I mean that I studied the Quran. According to Quran, Muhammad is not first Muslim. He is peacemaker who submit himself peacefully to the uh, God's law. Mm -hmm and also promote peace within self, within family, in, in, in the world, basically, peacemaker, yeah. Islam. But he is told, I mean, I was aware that this would be, actually I was aware that this title might be a problem for conservative Muslims, not for liberal Muslims. Oh really? But yeah. conservative Muslims, in fact, they are happy with this. Oh, no, they say not. Islam starts with Muhammad. Yes, but, yeah. they, well, no, they don't. They say okay. the first Muslim was either Abraham or Adam, yeah. and uh, mm, mm, and so on, and they're kind of angry yeah. with me for calling it the first Muslim. Uh, I chose the title because, in fact, Muhammad is told three times in the Quran itself to say, it's told Muhammad, say, I am the first Muslim. You're right. I am the word um, Muslim. And, um, I mean, literally, it's I am the first who makes Islam. Right. Um, uh, the context, when I look at it, I think chronologically at that time of Mecca, referring to that time, not kind of uh, from the... Uh, but that's okay, this no, title, I don't, I don't think that it is wrong, but it is within the condition. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. You know, it certainly did not mean the first Muslim capital M of exactly. a religion called Islam capital exactly. I. Islam was more, it was a, a, a philosophy, a way of being, a way of relating to the world and to God. Um, originally, before it became organized and institutionalized as a religion, which happened after Muhammad's death. But um, this happens with all religions after the, you know, the founding figure dies. But um, there was another factor involved too. There are lots of books out there called Muhammad, a biography. Muhammad, a life. Life of the Prophet, Life of Muhammad, and so on. And, you know, those are the books that I'd fallen asleep reading, and I thought, we do not need another book. Mm. The first Muslim, therefore, was a very attractive title, because firstly, to non-Muslims, it's clear who the first Muslim yes. is. Yes. Uh, but it also had the advantage of acting as a kind of a priori, right there on the cover, a warning to pious Muslims that this is not a pious biography, you know, okay. just by the choice of this title. And I think that is fair warning. Fantastic. Um, gosh, I can interview you on this book for days. I took so many notes. Let's see how many we can cover. <laughs> Most likely a fraction of it. Uh, on page 10 no, of... We shouldn't go too long or else yeah. people will start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the parallels between Muhammad and Jesus are striking, you say. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you want me to read this one or you... Uh, no, I think yeah. I can... <laughs> so. They are striking, first of all, the main message of both. I mean, okay, not the main message, but an essential part of the message of both was a message of social justice. It was a protest against corruption. Okay. And in fact, all three monotheisms began this way. Judaism began as a protest against the corruption of kings. Uh, the power and the arrogance and corruption of kings. 
Christianity began as a protest against the power, arrogance, and corruption of, of a priestly elite who were cooperating with a, an occupation, the Roman occupation of Palestine at the time. Islam began as a protest, basically as a, as a protest against the corruption of uh, an oligarchy yeah. in Mecca, right? This very, very wealthy elite, you know, the one percent of the time. And part of the... And it is a theocratic oligarchy. It is a theocracy. Not so much a theocracy. It was really about religious. money and power, but, you know, yeah. claiming religion okay. to yeah. substantiate itself, exactly. which is, of course, the pattern that we yeah. still see today. Yeah. Uh, you know, religion is used, it's manipulated, and so on. Mm. Um, so the people that Muhammad, his early followers, who were very few, by the way, just as the early followers of Jesus were very few, but they were very similar. Yeah. They were the disempowered, the disenfranchised, those who were pushed out to the exactly. margins of society, which included, of course, women. <laughs> um, as, you know, second, third, fourth sons who were not going to inherit freed men, freed slaves, slaves, uh, uh, d d d people who hired labor or, or, or who had been pushed off their land and had come to, you know, into the city in, in uh, the 7th century in, in, in Muhammad's time, into Mecca, um, and were just a kind of sort of underclass. Uh, in other words, the 7th century Meccan equivalent of the 99%. Um, and it was these whom Muhammad stood up for. And it was, it, it, you know, large parts of the Quran are an impassioned protest against social and economic injustice. Exactly, yeah. and this is really missing, deliberately or under whatever, through ignorance, is missed. Throughout the Quran there is a strong emphasis yeah. on social justice yeah. and equality. Yeah, and it was exciting, you know, when I finally sat down and yes. read it properly, as you know, it took me three months, <laughs> uh, instead of just, you know, sort of trying to read it through like you yeah. would a regular book. Yeah. Um, it was exciting to discover that. Yeah. You know, discover and the, all the elements in the Quran that I hadn't really realized existed. And also something is missing, I don't know whether you noticed, uh, some say that there is no love uh, in Islam or in Muhammad's religion, they say, but they ignore that it is the, uh, the most repeated attributes of God in the Quran is Rahman and Rahim mm -hmm. and the derivatives of that word. In fact, 113 chapter starts in the name of God who is loving and caring, mm -hmm. basically yeah. Rahman and Rahim. Yeah. And uh, the other is their emphasis on monotheism is also, I think, the very common. The emphasis on monotheism and, yeah. um, and also, I think, an extraordinary, um, especially for the time, uh, an extraordinary willingness to live and let live, which people, you know, non-Muslims don't usually associate with Muhammad. Uh, you know, sort of, to you, your religion, to me, mine. You know, it's, it's, yeah, okay, let's live by that. We don't all have to believe exactly the same thing. In fact, the world would be extremely boring if we did. Yes. You know, each one of us would just be a carbon copy of the other. And I, I realize this is what some of the Salafis actually want. I can't imagine a more boring world. I, I revel in, in, um, in pluralism, in difference, in, 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 in variety. That's what the, the, the whole joy of life is how different we all are. Even as we're all moving, hopefully, or we would all like to move, or at least the people I think watching this and you and I would like to move in the same direction, we do so in different ways. And I love that. Beautiful. And um, I noticed that uh, you quoted some miraculous kind of births and uh, events, especially even before prophethood. There is a lot of miracles attributed to Muhammad. Yeah. None of them you find in the Quran. Or maybe one or two of them, like Isra, there is a hint of it, yeah. which is not the same way it's yeah, told. Only a hint. I mean, the Quran yeah. specifically says, you know, says, you know, miracles. You are miracles. You are not given any miracle except yeah. this book except is this by book itself yeah. is yeah. evidence. Right. So uh, the Quran kind of looks down on miracles, which doesn't mean that there are not lots of miracle stories included in Ibn Ishaq, in fact. Uh, and you can see why. I mean, they, they, they respond to a very human need, you know. Um, you know, I, I can see and I, I, I feel you know, very intensely how beloved, I mean, and I mean beloved and revered Muhammad is among Muslims. And there is, there is, 
in the same way that Mary is revered and beloved among uh, Christians, particularly among Catholics, and there's always this, 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 therefore this tendency to, to clothe the beloved, revered person in, 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 in silk and pearls and diamonds and auras of light and so on. Uh, the problem with this is that once you start doing that, they become less of a person and more of a kind of icon. You, you, you oddly enough, the more the more devotion wants to bring them close, the more it pushes them further away as kind of inhuman. As their role model, as an example yeah, for you, for yeah. example. And um, and what I wanted to do was to see Muhammad as a man, as a person, to try to understand his humanness, which is why I spent so much time talking about his response to the first revelation on top of Mount Hira, which was astonishingly human. You know, I'm surprised, again, that in many areas that you independently studied you mm -hmm. came to in some cases to exactly the same conclusion as i or some other scholars who studied the quran that's what i mean but yeah it is very impressive I, very impressive. different places you exactly know. So. and here is a, one of your statement on page 11 muhammad is one of those rare lives that is more dramatic in reality than in legend totally in fact, the less one invokes the miraculous, the more extraordinary his life becomes. What emerges is something grander, precisely, precisely because it is human, to the extent that his actual life reveals itself worthy of the word legendary. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the Quran emphasizes this, say, I am a human being like you. Again, again. The only difference is there is only one God and he refuses to me that this is the yes. principle. But what he's saying basically Big. is, do not idolize me. Do not make another idol of me. I am human. I am one of you. And, um, and as fallible as anybody else too, which he acknowledged. Okay, we are continuing. Are you okay with me? Okay. <laughs> and initially I asked her whether she has a gun in her home. Oh, come because, on! Because I asked some question to you, <laughs> I may, <laughs> you may just be very upset with me. I'm, I'm, don't, don't be, be okay. I cannot okay. imagine anything more disgusting than having a gun in my Beautiful. home. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, you, lived, you didn't live in Arizona. <laughs> I know, I did, wherever I lived. Yeah. When I lived in the Middle East, it was the same thing. Sometimes I, I would, you know, go drive, and people would say, you know, the areas you're driving through, you really should carry a gun. And I said, no, what, 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 what would I do with it? Shoot someone? You know, no, no, no. The example in the Quran is about the children of Adam. One wants to kill the other because of certain jealousy, whatever. That uh, K -A -A Abe and Cain Abe story. And, Abel, yeah. and Abe says, rather than I kill you, I prefer to be killed. Very interesting. This <laughs> yeah. Quran gives the example of that. I'm not uh, sure I go quite that far, but yeah. let's just not kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> let's just make an agreement there. <laughs> However much we disagree, Lovely. we don't actually get to that yeah. stage. 30, on page 34, 35, you extensively give the account of heart surgery on Muhammad, which is, in fact, I think it is distortion, mistrans, mis interpretation of chapter Elam Nashrah Lekel Sadrak didn't we open your chest? Uh -huh. It's obviously it is not it's a metaphor. Okay, but I'm exploring it as a metaphor, yeah. aren't I? I, 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 I yeah, you criticized that one. You're very good yeah, in dealing with the I'm not saying that issues. this is what happened. Yeah, exactly. I'm yeah, yeah, of course. The pain of it. Yes, the, exactly. The, the, the radical um, impact of it. Exactly. Of open heart surgery. I like some of your expression, expression pretty much. I will quote few. What he, the six year old saw was a society in which the sacred and the profane mixed so easily that there was no saying where one left off mm -hmm. and the other began. And that it ends with uh, piety and profit were the twin engines of their city's prosperity. Yes, in Mecca, 7th century, plus a change. Which is now the same. <laughs> plus a change. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And uh, there was another account about 360 idols in Kaaba. You did very well in that, according to my own uh, mm. study. And uh, I found no evidence that they had even, uh, as kind of, in general, they didn't have even statutes as idols. No. 
And in fact, El Kelby in his book describes well, the, contradictory descriptions. The moment you use a term like idol, yes. it's, all, it's already judgmental. Yes. I call them totem gods. Yes, yeah. totem gods. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they were more esoteric, abstract. I, uh, how do you say, polytheists, they believed in intercession, mm -hmm. according to the Quran, that kind of intercession, giving power to someone besides God as... Again, is, is, is very, very human, you know, sort of, yeah. I, mean, I mean, again, pagan is another one of those very yeah. judgmental terms, yeah. so basically it doesn't mean somebody without religion, it yeah. means somebody who has, or without God, it means somebody who has many gods, mm -hmm. polytheist, uh, and among those, you know, and, and, and the, those gods included actual I mean, as you know, if you spend any time in the desert, you know, when you see a, a, a magnificent single stone standing alone, either, and it's, it's either of a particular material and it shines in the sun or it's a particular mm -hmm. shape mm -hmm. and so on. You, you know, if you could, you would bring it home and so on. Yeah. <laughs> and this is what they did. They brought yeah. them, you know, yeah. hauled them back to Mecca with, with, with camels, adopted them as, as, as tribal totems, as, you know, the, yeah. the tribal gods, but always, you know, arranged around the Kaaba of the time because the Kaaba was the residence of, it, there was still the one God who was above all the others, mm -hmm. Allah, right? Mm -hmm. The high one, right? Mm -hmm. Who was above all the others and remote, mm -hmm. remote. And this is why you needed all the others, because they were things, they were tangible. If you have a stone, right? So here, you have a stone and it's here. I can see it. I can feel it. Mm -hmm. I can, I can, I can caress it. Mm -hmm. I can speak to it. I can sacrifice mm -hmm. to it. I can bow down in front of it. I can relate to it and have a relationship with mm -hmm. it, right? It becomes a kind of personal god. And, and, and okay, it's a junior partner in the whole, you know, sort of like law firm of gods with Allah's his name on the door. But, but this one can perhaps intercede for me. And it's a very human need to do this, to have something tangible. Um, so I can understand it. I, you know, not particularly interested in it personally, mm -hmm. but I can definitely understand that need. You you may not agree with me, you don't need to make a comment, but here I would like to uh, express my observation in Sunni and Shiite world. I think they do exactly, even perhaps worse than Meccan uh, polytheists, uh, because look at the uh, Hajj. They go, there is a black stone there, they made up a hadith, oh, Prophet Muhammad kissed and stuff. I wouldn't kiss it if Prophet Muhammad didn't it. And then they go revere that they step on each other. They push each other to kiss that one. Another stone, which is, it was really a place of meeting. It's basically Nas for mm -hmm. people to worship and to support each other, to meet each other. Kaaba, people would go inside. They wouldn't go rotate, circumambulate around the stone. Well, they did. I think they did. They did, and before Islam, they did. Um, they they and could circumambulate. Just basically means that you 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 go around it, you know, seven times with your left shoulder inwards. Why the left shoulder? Which side of your body is the heart on? And it's a way of binding yourself to the place. And I, you know, even before Islam, this was not only part of the pilgrimage. Uh, um, and you know, the Hajj existed before Islam. Of course, too. of course. It was not only part of the pilgrimage, but it was also any time a Meccan went on a journey. When he came back, and it usually was he, because really the men who went on journeys, the first thing he would do was go to the Kaaba, which was at the heart of Mecca, mm -hmm. the very center, mm -hmm. s walk around it with his left shoulder in. It was a kind of way of binding himself anew to the place, saying, I am of this place, and this place is of me. So it's, it's, it's an ancient, and, and, and you see it also in, in uh, various shrines, various uh, uh, Hindu shrines and Buddhist shrines and so on. Uh, you see it in the Jewish marriage ceremony with the husband's circles, the bride, the mm -hmm. groom circles the bride seven times around, right? Also, you can say, left side in. It's a way of binding yourself to the place. Um, and I love that it became, you know, part of the Muslim house too. But it is, when I look at it, I, th I think the theme of stone is there. Hajar al Aswad, the black stone kiss. And there is a stone which is covered with silk and the golden ornamental silk and it's circumambulated around. Mm -hmm. And they go stone and other stone, saying this is, and which is not in, none of them in the Quran. Mm -hmm. In fact, ta tawaf means going to Kaaba and going back, return, mm -hmm. round trip to Kaaba. But mm -hmm. anyway, when I look at it, and the hair of Muhammad, all around the world, they they have certain hair, They wherever they found, yeah, just they kiss his hair, or his uh, clothes, her, her yeah. kai, sheriff, they call it, his jacket, whatever, his uh, 
rope. Uh, these, are, you know, these are still. You find these yeah. everywhere. You find them exactly. in Catholicism. You the find them. You know, go to Mexico, you'll see them. Go to a tiny little church in yes. the Galilee, and you'll find behind the altar there's the, there's a place with, you know full of votives. You know, yes. sort of the, the statues and you know statues of hearts, statues of exactly. limbs. You know, sort of, sort of sort of begging for intercession and for healing. Um, you will find these everywhere, and they're just human. It's um, the idea of an abstract universal God is, is so remote. You find this in evangelical Christianity here in the United States where everybody talks about a personal God, this desire to, uh, to interact, right, yeah. with um, the infinite. It's, it's, you know, on the one hand such chutzpah, on the other hand just so very human. Um, it is uh, on page 50 I, I would like to quote you about Quraysh, their business was faith and their faith was in business. Oh, yeah. And um, on social justice, I still, I love this part because it's so important when you look at the Muslim world, so much poverty and also so much very filthy rich that they claim they are righteous, they are Muslim, but people are starving or people on the street, they don't care about them. and. Uh, I, I love very much about your book emphasizing this message of Muhammad. Yeah, with the outrage, yeah. the Muhammad's outrage or God's outrage, depending on your point of view, in the Quran about this kind of inequality is palpable, yes. totally palpable. Uh, matched also, by the way, with the outrage that sons are preferred to daughters, that sons are valued over daughters. Total outrage about that. Reflecting also the fact that Muhammad had four daughters. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, that one is also slavery. I think that uh, point you missed uh, in the book yeah. uh, about slavery, they made up stories. They said, well, the Quran did not prohibit slavery, which is, I think, one of the biggest lies about the Quran, about Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And slavery is, in fact, prohibited by la ilaha illallah. Mm -hmm. There is no God except God. And the Quran says there is no Rab, means Lord besides yeah. God. Erbabun ma'Allah, you know some Arabic. A little bit. Yeah, and Erbabun uh, ma'Allah. Therefore, if someone claims to have a slave, slave is abd. Mm -hmm. He claims to be a rab in Arabic. He claims to be like Pharaoh because Pharaoh said, "Ana rabbukum al I am your highest lord. Uh -huh. I owe you. Uh, kind of, I own your life. I control your life. And therefore, la ila, anyone who says there is only one God who is the only rab cannot claim to be Rab, the Lord of another God person. Himself to somebody else, yeah, right? therefore slavery is not only a sin, it's the greatest sin. Therefore, it cannot be said, oh, there is no this kind of magical word prohibition. Mm -hmm. No, but there are verses in the Quran, someone says, there is reference to slaves. Of course, there were Christians, Jews, or uh, other people, mm -hmm. polytheists, they had slaves. And you couldn't eliminate their slavery because you had limited power. Therefore, there were certain rules involving them, but there is very strong... Uh, this is this, this, one of the things I, yeah. I notice very strongly in the Quran is again and again, uh, Muhammad comes up against, oh God, again, depending on your point yeah. of view, comes up against um, existing practices, mm -hmm. right? But it's a very subtle approach to these existing practices to do with fighting, to do with slavery, to do with uh, uh, polytheism and so on. And it says, basically, it says, well, you know, if you really feel you must, right, and if this, ha and if this condition, but you know, it, it, it's not really going to work, and, it, but, 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 and then it comes around, basically what it says, it's almost like a Jewish mama say, you know, Better if you don't. And it's, it's, it's a very subtle approach, and, and I think it's a very wise one. Instead of coming up and saying, no way, ban it and so on, which will only, you know, get people's backs up. It says, listen, think about this. Think about what you're doing. Look at what it is you're doing, and you'll see I if think, you really think Leslie, about it, that better if you don't. Leslie, do I it. think you are getting this very wrong, just <laughs> the opposite impression from reading distorted translations, honestly. Yeah. It is very clear. Um, categorically rejection of slavery from the beginning. They do not, for example, accept Aqaba. Mm. It is the, uh, those who are basically slaves to release yeah. them, free them. This is description of ingrates. 
not Muslims. And there are many strong verses about it. But as I said, referring to slaves, for example, freeing the slaves, yeah. says if you do this, commit this, uh, uh, let's say, sin, free slaves. Whose slaves? It's not your slave. Yeah. You cannot have slave. Yeah. But some others go free yeah. slaves. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, okay, almost. I, basically, oh. I agree with you. We just <laughs> uh, I love your description of Uqa's fair. Wow. <laughs> the lovely, lovely. That section is just beautiful, and it continues. And I don't want to. I don't have much time. And uh, at that section, this is um, uh, chapter four. The end of the chapter four. You refer to Muhammad as who could could neither read nor write. Uh, I I don't blame you for this. Maybe, this is a very common. Not. Yeah. You know, he was a trader, so one presumes that, you know, it was a trader's agent and on those yeah. huge uh, trade caravans, one presumes that he had some way of recording yeah. you know, the of deals that were made. Um, and I don't really, you know, personally I don't really understand the, the Islamic, you know, the pious Islamic insistence that he was, that he could not read or write because um, I realized that, you know, it's meant to be part of the argument that the Quran was, you know, given and rather than he himself wrote it, but I don't see that this is. Exactly. It makes they... any sense. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense to me, that argument. Um, it's, uh, but I really don't think it's important. But we, what we do know is that it was very few people could read or write at the time in Arabia. It was largely an oral society. When we use the word illiterate, it's another of those very judgmental words like, you know, pagan and idle and so on. You know, we use illiterate now in the You're 21st right. century Pejorative to word. mean, you know, ignorant. It's not. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've spent quite some time with Bedouin in, in, in Sinai, with Bedouin elders who probably now are all dead. But, uh, who were the, the repository of the, the stories of their tribes, which they would tell in hours-long poems, narrative poems, at night on the dunes, right, in, in northern Sinai, uh, entirely from memory. And it was just, you know, we've forgotten how wonderful the human memory is. What happened basically is that printing replaced memory. You know, you didn't need to memorize anything anymore. It's all there. You can just go on, you know, check it out in Wikipedia or whatever. But there was a time at Homer, the whole of Homer was, was, was oral poetry, right? The Bible began as oral poetry. The Quran is supreme oral poetry, basically. Um, and of course, you know, the, 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 the way it was transmitted, you know, until maybe about 10 years after uh, Muhammad's death is when, as far as we know, as far as we can ascertain, when it first began to be written down. Uh, mm. It went from, you know, from lip to ear, from lip to ear, from mouth to you know, one person to another. And, um, and I don't know if you've ever listened to books on tape, but there is a directness to it that doesn't come when you're actually reading. It's like the voice is, if it's good and if it's well read, it goes deep inside you and it stays there. You remember phrases, you remember things that you just pass over when you're reading. It's a very, very powerful form of communication that sadly, will be we kind of lost contact with yeah. today. Uh, I agree with that point, but I think they fabricated that lie, I call it big lie, because mm -hmm. they all agreed on, in order to exaggerate the so-called literary miracle of the Quran, how any literate person can do that. It was a kind of pious lie I do consider, because uh, let me tell you why I don't believe that Muhammad was, was literate. Mm -hmm. And I argued extensively in the beginning well, of Quran and Reformist translation. I don't think it matters. I really yeah. don't think it matters. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, it, it matters because uh, how it shows how they made up uh, such a lie. Why? And to me, it is insult to him because if he dictated the Quran to scribes according to their stories, which I believe Quran was written during the time of Muhammad, mm -hmm. not later. Mm -hmm. It is another story. But if he did for 23 years, he dictated to Zaid bin Sabit and others, and how in the world a person with normal intelligence would not be able to recognize 28 letters. And he, according to their own stories, he promoted reading and writing, correct? He released the, uh, those who were captives 
in, in the, if they teach 10 people well, in Medina. If he did right. that, why he didn't himself become an example and learn it? Therefore, there is insult to his intelligence, I believe, which is uh, I, I, I get. Think, I think but basically I think it's yeah. a complete misunderstanding Ummi of what means an oral culture Gentile. is. A yeah. complete misunderstanding yeah. of what an oral culture is. You know, we tend to look at the past with a kind of 21st century arrogance. You know, so we it's like looking through a telescope the wrong way around. We put a telescope to your eye the wrong way and everything becomes smaller, tiny, tiny, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's what we're doing. We tend to sort of think, well, you know, we're so much more civilized and literate and sophisticated and so on. It's... Not so. Not I love the chapter so. of about Khadija. That is a chapter that made me cry. Honestly, that's well done. What do you think uh, about Khadija? If you just summarize his first wife, yeah. which uh, according to those books he married when he was young. He was mm -hmm. twenty-five, correct? According to that, but uh, she was older, yeah. and she died in fact mm -hmm. before early. He became, yeah. Before he became a leader. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we have very little in Khadija's own words because she died before he became a leader. So people were yes. really writing down or memorizing rather everything that she said, you know. Uh, but it's clear from his reported words and from the you know, reported memories of others that uh, even though she died, I think it was in 619 and he died in 632 in the common era, he mourned her until the day of his own death. And, you know, it's true, he married nine wives after her, because by then he was a political leader, this is what political leaders, you know, the world over did at the time. He made multiple marriages, because marriage was a means of sealing political alliance. They were diplomatic marriages. And I think maybe one sign of this is that while he had four daughters with Khadija, and uh, reportedly one son who died in infancy, he had no children with any of the late life wives, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Mm. Um, you have uh, about uh, re revelation. You consider that, of course, you are agnostic. You know, we're going to go a long time. If we I love that. You you quote Otto and then William James. Mm and uh, about possible oh, psychologists, since yeah. you are a psychiatrist, uh, psychologist, psychologist, not psychiatrist, psychologist, therefore you tend to a little bit um, kind of consider it as a psychological. Well, of course, because what I'm interested in is the experience. I'm interested in Muhammad's experience. I'm interested in, uh, and I mean no disrespect but, but with this, I, mean, I, I wanted to know what it was like to be Muhammad, right? And that requires, um, a certain amount of imagination, it requires empathy, it requires going as deep as I can into the sources and finding the ones that resonate, that speak to me, you know, of real life human experience, like his, his fear, his terror that he experienced after the first revelation of the Quran, you know, when he was convinced that he was losing his mind and his first impulse was to kill himself, you know. To, wow! And you look at this and you think... I really don't you know, believe that, Leslie. Oh, I do. Absolutely. This Come seems on. To me, this seems to me a wonderfully human response he didn't i received a revelation myself mm -hmm. you may laugh at me once in my life and it was one of the most very interesting but most joyful thing in my life and it contradicts the later story which in your book i think you indicate that later he was looking for waiting for revelation when it ceased for two years if one someone is terrified from something Really, come on, that person will be looking for that? It, it contradicts that. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so he comes right down the mountain, he finds refuge in, the, in, in you know, with Khadija, who takes him in, in her arms and says, maybe you were the prophet of this people. And she reassures him and so on and so on, but he's still not sure. And then there's two years of what's basically a dark night of the soul. And I use the phrase as St. John of the Cross used it, the man who first used it, sort of... Um, a kind of mystical emptiness waiting you know to see if this was real or if, or if it was never going to happen again and you know it was a delusion on his part the very fact that he could even consider the fact that you know that that idea seems to me you know he didn't come sort of running down the mountains sort of you know sort of absolutely sure that he had the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and so on and so on and ready to declare it to everybody he you know 
his basic response was, me? Perhaps, perhaps fear. God, I mean, this is impossible. Yeah. Man speaks with d d d no. How could this happen? You know. Yeah. Um, and it shows to me first a tremendous humility, but second, um, it just seems very, very. Human. I think it is exaggerated. I understand fear or trepidation, anxiety, that responsibility. Yeah, the account in his own words of the, you know, the, just the physical experience of that with this yeah. huge weight bearing down to him he felt like the breath was being, the life was being squeezed out of him and he was sure he was going to die. I mean, that sounds terrifying to me. I don't know his own words because yeah. this narration here say, Reported. we look at it critically, I look at it the other way, I understand uh, you and others could take it that way. Well, but you know, with, <laughs> The thing with history is that you deal with the information you have. Uh, you assess it, you try to evaluate how reliable it is and so on. But you can't make up new information. It doesn't, you know, you, you have what's available. The basic sources don't change. And then it's a matter of assessing them and seeing which ones resonate with that stuff of reality to me. Um, and that, you know, that's what I tried to do all along. And as I say, I was trying to get a... Yeah. His experience, this is where the psychology comes in, just, just the experience in itself um, and respecting that experience. I don't know if God spoke to Muhammad or not, but I do know that he experienced it and I respect that experience. Yeah, you quote a chapter, God did not abandon you yeah. neither uh, that yeah the, that's the second the yeah second that's uh, yeah. It shows there was a certain time Muhammad mm -hmm. thought he was abandoned mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. that's beautiful um, there is a description of my gosh so many things here a description yeah, of how, how excommunication long we because I think we're going to start uh, losing viewers if we go on to yeah time. well there are viewers trust me to the end they will watch <laughs> the others wherever they leave let them leave don't I'm worry sorry, about others, that <laughs> she had no illusion about how hard it would be it is in uh, the end of part one uh, mm -hmm. and says she had no illusion about how hard it would be. This is about uh, Khadija, I yeah. believe. As though the terror of his experience that night was not enough, she knew Muhammad faced yet another level of fear, the very human fear that this was too much to ask of him and that he would be unequal to the task. Yeah. Because if she was right and Waraka too, then the respect that Muhammad had worked so long and hard for was now in jeopardy. Here's this 40 year old man yeah. who was born an orphan. His father dead before he was born, and his mother died when he was age six. Shunted from household to household, very much on the margins of his own society. I know there's all kinds of story about how he, how he was Abu Talib's favorite and so on and so on, but you know, Abu Talib's favorite would not be working as a camel boy on one of the caravans to, to uh, Damascus, which is one of the most famous childhood stories of him that takes place. Um, so he's born sort of within the ruling tribe of Mecca, but very much on the margins, which, and, and, and brought up for the first five years with Bedouin, right? Uh, which also allowed him to see his own society very differently once he got back. Um, and he works his way up the hard way, and he becomes, you know, a, a, a business agent on the caravans. And then, you know, Khadija hires him sees who he is, she proposes to him because he's so much lower status than her, he can't propose to her, he has no money of his own and so on. And they have four beautiful daughters and by age 40 it seems like, you know, here's this man sort of born with the most unpromising prospects in life and he's like, he's respected. He's, no, he's not one of the movers and shakers no. of Mecca, but he's, he's respected. He's carved out a good life for himself, he has everything to be grateful for. So therefore, you know, what I asked was, so, so why was he up there on Mount Hero? Why did he go up there alone, meditating through the yeah. night, you know, standing through the night and so on, which is when the first revelation happened to him? Uh, because he sensed, you know, that it, it, he, despite his good fortune, he was, you know, the, the, his whole childhood, you don't, you know, it comes with you. And he could see what was happening in Mecca. He could see the corruption. He could see the greed. He could see the arrogance. Uh, but then to accept a role like this, as the prophet, to put yourself publicly in opposition 
to the movers and shakers, to the people who rule your own city, your own land, is to put yourself in such an incredibly vulnerable position. He knew it. So, you know, he's born on the margins. He becomes even more marginalized as he gets attacked by the movers and shakers of, of Mecca, and you know all the stories about verbal and physical harassment and so on, culminating in the attempt on his life. He's then forced into exile. I know Hishra is usually yes. translated as immigration, but it was exile. He was exiled from his home to Medina, 200 miles to the north. And one of the most remarkable things about him, as I saw it, was that this, this incredible ability to turn what seemed like disadvantage into advantage. I mean, exile is the ultimate marginalization. You're thrown out of your land, thrown out of your home. And he turned it into advantage, created this whole new society along Islamic lines in Medina. And then, amazingly, eight years, just eight years later, there's the Fatah, right? Medea, uh, Mecca opens up to him, and he's welcomed back as the ultimate insider. It's an amazing story. And Did he kill happened. those people, hang them? I think there were According eight fatalities. Yeah. There were eight, there were eight or twelve, I've forgotten how I many. Yeah. Uh, an astonishing small number, mm -hmm. considering that there have been three battles, or more like armed skirmishes, between Mecca and Medina in, the, in those eight years. Uh, one of the things he did was that he took... Um, Whenever he was able, he took the leaders of the, those who would be the leaders of the opposition to him in Mecca and gave them senior positions in his new administration. I mean, he took in, he took in his opponents and sort of brought them inside. He didn't seek uh, for revenge. No. Yeah, no, this is really no, the no teaching revenge. of the Quran. This is yeah. throughout the Quran. And he makes it quite clear, yeah. you know, and when he's asked by his followers, you know, well, you know, what if we get attacked, you know, when we go into Mecca, it's the holy city, and I'm not meant to, you know, fight, and so on, and so on. He says, well, again, it's one of the better if you don't things, sort of, only if they try to stop you getting to the Kaaba, only if they attack you first, and only if, you know, there's no truce in place, and so on, and so on, and even then, God is merciful, blah, 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 blah. better if you don't, you know. Uh, two more so, things, we are finishing okay. this one, uh, Leslie. Okay. One is, uh, is uh, I have to mention this one, about the incident of Benny Kreiser. Yeah. I wish that uh, I had uh, sent you an article, there are many articles written on this issue, mm -hmm. of course, but one article was very convincing to me, because I doubt, not I doubt, I really don't think that Muhammad would kill those people, captives, just yeah, mess, about, because it, the, last the Quran time. doesn't mention, doesn't even reference to that. If there was such a major event, Quran would come to defense of Muhammad. There are many instances in the Quran mentions. Yeah. And, and the author of that article finds almost the same, exactly the same figures, the same events mentioned much before, longer before Muhammad mm -hmm. came to life. And similar stories later mm -hmm. repeated. And they find this maybe a propaganda, someone, or to justify this kind of action by later sultans, Umayyad yeah. dynasties, to, oh, here, Muhammad did, we can do the same. Yeah. Because I find some of the things that is distorted, for example, polygamy in the Quran, you look at it, it is in the context of supporting the widows who have orphans, about protecting orphans. It was and not again, about virgins. Yes, if you insist, you can have up to four wives, but you know, only if you can treat them equally and you know you actually won't be able to do yeah, that yeah. you won't be able to support them yeah. equally and so it is discouraged but it was a social <laughs> yeah. uh, exigent circumstances exactly. many men died in order to take care of widow yeah. stuff yeah. but in this case many crazy i think it is really an insult to prophet muhammad which according to the quran is a peacemaker and cannot captives cannot be killed according to the quran they should be released but if a person kills someone, you know that person kills someone, the family of the murderers yeah. can uh, uh, accept yeah. or the Quran says if you forgive better, accept yeah. kind of yeah. a peaceful solution yeah. for that. Therefore, Beni Kureza, since it is not mentioned in the Quran at all, that's major incident. And second, if there was, I am not a historian, that guy mentions some exactly similar events. If happened before, but it is a repetition okay. of that. Send me that article. I yeah, I will send to yeah, you, yeah, that I would be nice to, if to, you... Just to clarify, because yeah. I don't know what we're talking about. Exactly. We're talking about, there were three Jewish tribes, small, very small Jewish Beni tribes. Beni Nader, Beni Kainuka. Medina, right. When uh, Muhammad arrived, it had been an almost entirely Jewish oasis. 
but uh, no, that had been a hundred years before. You know, some of the some of the Jewish tribes had left, and others had been sort of marginalised. Um, and not surprisingly, the Jews, since they already were monotheists, you know, weren't as responsive as Muhammad hoped they were. And it's clear all through the Quran that he really, really hoped. I mean, he was relying on the Jews. He was relying on their support and was actually surprised when he didn't get it. Um, and because for the Jews, prophecy, prophecy had ceased with the exile to Babylon. Prophecy had ceased a thousand years before, right? There could be no more prophets, and yet here was this prophet. They accepted his political leadership, but not his spiritual leadership. And this was a source, as is clear in Ibn Ishaq at least, of continual uh, strife and bad feeling. It led to two Jewish tribes being expelled, and then the third one, the story is in Ibn Ishaq, that all the men on whose chins, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, on whose chins razors had passed, mm -hmm. right? Uh, were executed. In other words, a massacre. And this is something that is usually tiptoed around and sort of, oh, let's not even go there and so on for obvious reasons in the 21st century context where uh, Jewish Arab, you know, or Jewish Muslim tends to get translated into terms of Israel Palestine, which is, you know, a false equivalence. Um, so I determined you know, not to tiptoe around it. Um, it's a very, very disturbing episode. I had terrible dreams, nightmares, when I was writing about it, and I found it very, very difficult to write, but I thought it was... Uh, um, I did not want to tiptoe around it, because I don't think that does any respect yeah. to yeah. Muhammad. But trying to figure out what was happening here, what were the politics involved here, how come such a thing could happen, and so on, I think I might have gotten somewhere. I'm not sure. You obviously disagree, but that's okay. Yeah, send me, send yeah I will send you that article. Yeah. And uh, I forgot to say when we talk about Jesus, Reza Aslan, uh, I don't know whether you know uh, yeah. his book, The Zealot. Yeah. Have you read that one? Yeah. How do you think? It's, it's, it's a, a very appealing sort of synthesis of, of a, a lot of the research that's been done on the historical Jesus over the last 30 years or so, and it's a, a tremendous body of research. Um, and uh, and I, I, I love the fact that he did it. I love how he handled that whole Fox News interview business. I love the fact that it became a bestseller. I mean, as a Jew who's written a biography of <laughs> Muhammad, of course I love the book by a Muslim who's written I love the Jesus. book, and yeah. that was a really good take. That was, I, I, I had the same impression of Jesus mm -hmm. because I studied Bible too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I didn't have that uh, detailed information about that he's providing. Yeah. Fantastic book. And one last question. And I, uh, I like also that he gave it the Palestinian uh, background, which is what I did in my biography of Mary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, if uh, today, for example, Muslim world have major issues. One is, uh, like, say, they get very angry when someone insults Muhammad. But people insult God, they don't care, or Jesus, they don't care, as if Jesus, according to Quran, is not one of the great prophets. And uh, but they get very animated. They want to kill the person, and uh, like uh, Salman Rushdie. And uh, uh, not only that, you know. Um, and. Uh, there's just been a big thing in India with Hindu, you know, the, the uh, right-wing Hindu group getting a uh, uh, a book by a very serious scholar of Hinduism, Western scholar mm -hmm. of Hinduism, mm -hmm. Wendy Doniger. They uh, forced the publishers to pulp all editions of that book. Possibly the Christians were doing in during Inquisition time yeah. too, yeah. and uh, but. According to the Quran, if you remember chapter 4, verse 140, this is the book that Prophet Muhammad preached, that dedicated his life for, and he was guided by this very book. The Quran says, if people, you are discussing issues with them, if they insult your religion, make mockery, not insult, mockery of your religion, leave them, pay them no attention, and I then come back when they come to their senses. Very interesting, not only leaving them in peace, mm -hmm. and also do not cut relation altogether because they, they are not in it, intellectual it, mindset. Why does it surprise you yeah. that the majority, the, the, not the majority, but that some, you know, that a certain sector of people who proclaim to be religious, whether we're talking Jews yeah. or Christians or Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists, whatever religion, that a certain sector of people who claim to be the most devout and the most loyal and the utmost believers 
are in fact do in fact behave and believe things that are entirely counter yep, exactly. to their religion, counter to what their, their 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 sacred books say, counter to what their prophets and founding figures say. It's <laughs> well, I see the Quran. You know, it's yeah. I think it's just the sign of you know, all these religions began, as I say, as 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 movements of 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 liberation of 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 you know social and economic and, and national and individual liberation Freedom. for the the, the 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 dignity and integrity of every human person what happened to them after the founding figures died is i think uh or, or at least some parts of them after the founding figures died and over the centuries is just testimony to the indomitable human ability to mess things up but the Quran is the best things and emphasizes them these majority of people do not really believe they kind of idol worship comes here idol worship my clergyman create human idols in the past they themselves become demi god semi idols therefore they manipulate people but monotheism Leslie is the one that free you and me says there is no clergyman between you and God yes. no politicians you are free only the perfect God's attributes are what the best attributes the truth means seek the truth no one can come between yeah. you and truth but then the or justice the sheer and arrogance of anybody who claims yep. to be able to read the mind of God yeah and to know the will of God is just amazing but there's plenty of it out there last question was Muhammad Sunni or Shiite? <laughs> <laughs> Tie to your book. <laughs> oh God, he would have been so dismayed by that. So dismayed. The prophet of unity. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Thank you very much, Leslie. I hope that we will have another one. I hope so. And on yeah. many other issues. And uh, I have been here for two days in Seattle. And... Uh, Great city. Oh well. But the sun didn't shine for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yesterday, where we went, do we have a picture? Do you want to talk about no, that? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.